Piston engines have been developed for over a century, but many believed a rotary was here to change history. We all know how that turned out, but besides Mazda and Sachs, there was one more company that also put more hope and time into the Wankel engine development. The story of Norton's rotary engine is full of passionate people, important decisions on the edge of bankruptcy, and one inherited engine license which brought the resurrection of a then-dying motorcycle industry in Britain. In 1972, BSA as Birmingham's small arms company was struggling and was merged with other brands under a Norton Villiers Triumph joint venture. The new firm received several motorcycle projects from BSA, one of which was a rotary engine. BSA had been working on it ever since 1969. 90% of the projects from BSA were cancelled, but not the rotary thanks to a guy named David Gorsite. Being a mechanical engineer who previously worked at Rolls-Royce, developing a diesel alternative of Felix Wankel's patent, he managed to persuade NVT's boss, Dennis Poor, to let the rotary live and do their best with it. Gorsight wrote down the whole development into a single document. His inspiration came from the Hercules W2000, which held a Fichtel and Sachs single rotor in its frame. He did basically the same thing, put a 294cc KM914 engine into a BSA B25 Starfire motorcycle. A 30 horsepower power plant was found to be insufficient, but it was smooth and allegedly reliable. Gorsai doubled the number of rotors, and now the real R&D began. Fundamentally, the KM914 engine was air-cooled, and so was the reworked Norton's one. It actually shared many parts from the German unit. Besides regular fins on the exterior, the engine would cool itself from the inside by sucking filtered air mixed with fuel and oil and sending it through its internal pass like an eccentric shaft and rotors. It worked, but was far from perfect. The Wankel itself runs really hot and can be underpowered under certain circumstances. Gorsight looked deeper into the problem and found out that the Sax engine would only work consistently with a fan. Water cooling was proposed, but allegedly would not be well received by customers. They stuck with the charge cooling, but did some interesting trickery. First, the carburetors were moved further away from the filter between a plenum and combustion chambers. Then, half lemon openings in the housings from the original BSA concept were enlarged into full lemon-like holes, now without a pressure disruption. This cooled down the engine more efficiently, but heated up charged air, which is not ideal for volumetric efficiency. Initially proposed to be cooled by water-to-air intercooler, Gorsite introduced a large pressed steel plenum of a volume of 5 liters, which lowered the air temperature by 20 degrees of Celsius. This intake piece was a part of the motorcycle frame, and after the plenum, air was drawn into the constant velocity carburetors and then the rotor chambers. Some serious work was placed into redesigning rotors as well. The stock KM914 and later KC24 rotors worked fine, but it was found out that by reshaping a rotary size, 5 to 10% more torque could be gained. However, it shortened the lifespan of the rotors from 60,000 miles to about 5,000 miles at most, with cracks occurring after just 2 hours on a test bed at 7500 rpm. The internal design of the rotor was changed, with added cooling fins, and thereafter, the rotors easily survived over 75 hours of wide open throttle at 7500 rpm. To gain the most of the top end power, the most aggressive type of porting was introduced to the engine peripheral ports, giving the engine the typical and famous prop prop sound. It made idle quite rough, but engineers were able to achieve a stable, misfire-free idle speed of 850 rpm. 
Overall, the engine had over 85% higher horsepower output than the original Sax engine, just thanks to the improved cooling and chasing higher volumetric efficiency. While the Hercules produced about 91 horsepower per liter, the Norton Classic had over 134 horsepower per liter. It had a much higher rev range, a higher compression ratio of 9.2 to 1, and pretty good fuel economy too. An oil pump, similar to a two-stroke engine one, was used to inject lubricant to essential parts of the engine, and in the end, a bare engine weighed only 22 kilograms. Gorsight stated that the fuel consumption of the twin rotor was competitive to the best class four-stroke engines, and much superior to any six-cylinder which they considered as competition. After a laborious development, it is interesting to know that the initial target was an output of 50 to 60 horsepower with any given amount of rotors needed. The aim was more towards performance classes as they thought it would be much more expensive to compete in the low-power four-stroke singles and two-stroke two-cylinder categories. The first mentions of the upcoming rotary engine reached press media yet in 1974. However, the very first usable rotary Norton rolled down the factory line in 1984, over a decade later after the first approval in 1972. It was called the Interpol II and was only sold in fleets for civilian and the military police and RAC in Britain. It used an 85 horsepower engine, ran very smooth and provided a usable pull yet from 1500 RPM. Built side by side with the Interpol II, in 1987 a Norton Classic appeared in a limited run for public sale. As reliability had been already tested in the fleet model line, 100 customers could buy the new rotary powered Classic. Today the model is highly collectible, but it was not the last Wankel Norton for ordinary people. In 1988, a Norton Commander was introduced as a successor to the Interpol II. It was fully fared and sold in two versions, a police single-seater and a two-seater for people like you and me. The difference was that the engine was re-engineered and accommodated a water cooling of the hot part of the rotor housings. The liquid-cooled engine also received an intercooler besides the intake plenum for more superior charge air cooling. During hard accelerations, a part of the air bypassed the engine internals and was drawn directly into the carburetors, using the richer mixture as an internal cooling compensation. <laughs> Sales were struggling, and there was a patient employee, Brian Crichton, who spent countless hours squeezing more power out of the twin rotor. He managed to achieve 96 horsepower, about 12% increase. It was evident that a racing bike could be competitive, and although Crichton would not receive support from above, he was allowed to work on the engine in his spare time, recycling old and crash Interpol 2s. The 588cc unit eventually reached 125 horsepower on a test bench by improving and separating carburetion and cooling while retaining the stock compression ratio. It used 34mm twin microling carbs for fuel delivery. A concept bike was able to go beyond 155 miles per hour, allegedly up to 170 miles per hour, and was dubbed the RCW588. The factory's ignorance would disappear with a company owner changeover in 1988, and a year later, the bike received John Player's special sponsorship. The bike was achieving records and victories all over the country, including the Isle of Man TT and British F1. Allegedly, the highest output of the RCW588 ever achieved was over 140 horsepower. <laughs> A 
is its legacy. Norton introduced a detuned road-going replica, the F1 using the motor from the Commander. However, the racing success did not help sales, and the F1 was the last Norton rotary motorcycle offered. Bracknell could not stop working on the rotary engine. He partnered with Rotron Power, a rotary aero engine expert, and kept developing the unit. First, a Crackton CR700P was created with a 200 horsepower 700cc engine using an interesting but not specified sealed pressurized gas cooling system with a belt driven pump. <laughs> In 2021, Crichton's culmination of his engineering career was announced. The subject was called a Crichton CR700W and it was a twin rotor superbike following his experience in Norton. It was created thanks to a 12-year-old cooperation with the Rotron company. The engine is built from an in-house machined high-strength aluminum alloy with engine wear surfaces covered in molybdenum and nicosil for the lowest possible friction and high wear resistance. The eccentric shaft is made of a steel and the rotor sealing is secured thanks to two-piece silicon nitrate ceramic apex seals. There is also a titanium and inconel exhaust ejector system creating a vacuum for the maximum possible internal rotor cooling. The engine is said to have close to zero wear and should hold a season full of track days. 